Welcome to Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I'll be covering every studio song the band has recorded and every bonus track that I can find. Each week we'll go over a new song from the beginning to where they are currently, and as they keep adding albums, I'll keep adding shows. Let the deep dive party begin. In the magic garden, some were singing, some were dancing. Well, hello and welcome to the very first review episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. I am so happy to be able to launch this show and bring it to you guys. And uh, I know that you've been patient and waiting while we've worked through some technical issues and some uh, formats. But you know what? I think the show is going to be much better for it. So I promise you it was worth the wait, as you will hear and hopefully agree. So oh, there was no Uriah Heat podcast before. There are some other deep dive podcasts from different bands that we're going to talk about in a moment. But uh, I thought, you know, it would be kind of nice if uh, there was some reflecting the 24 current albums that the band has out with more to come. They're heading back into the studio planning on early next year, COVID uh, providing that they're able to do that. But uh, for now, that's plenty of songs to work off of. And uh, we're going to go through every single song. Now, I'm not doing any of the live stuff. We're just talking about studio recorded songs that were on the albums and bonus tracks from the deluxe editions. Uh, I may do some live stuff at some point, kind of as a side or a bonus episode. Time will tell. I think if I were going to do one, maybe the Live in 73 album would be a good one to do because that's, um, that's really well known. But uh, for now, we're just going to start with the studio tracks. And the very first song that appeared on the very first album, as we all know, was Gypsy. And we're going to dive into Gypsy today. Um, I, I have to say, uh, you know, it's, it's been a real pleasure getting to work directly with Mick Box to get this all set up. He's been absolutely wonderful. Um, as you guys may have heard on my other show, the Haskin Cast podcast, I interviewed Mick. On, I actually spoke to him on Labor Day in America. And, uh, and then I talked to Russell Gilbrook. And then, of course, uh, the, the recently departed Ken Hensley. And then Paul Newton. So I've had a, a, some really nice interviews with some of the members of the band. It's been very heartwarming to hear how passionate everyone still is for this music that now this album was released 50 years ago. And to think about the impact that it's had has been absolutely amazing. But let's take a step back and set the scene a little bit, because what's really happening here is we're talking about a time frame where nothing existed like this music. The closest you had, I would probably say off the top of my head, would be probably King Crimson, because they were a little bit more on the progressive side with uh, some jazzy elements in there. Um, definitely doing kind of really outside of the box kind of music. And, but there wasn't a lot like this. So what Uriah Heep really invented was a style and a sound that was unprecedented. And personally, I really think has, has shaped the way that people wrote and performed music for a long time. I think even people are influenced by it today. And you can't ever, ever uh, discount the impact that they've had. It's really weird because people always talk about, you know, the, the classic top three bands from that era, and they talk about Deep Purple, Black Sabbath, and Led Zeppelin. I've never understood why Led Zeppelin was considered a, like a metal band, because they really weren't that heavy. They had a couple of heavy songs, but for the most part, when I think Led Zeppelin, I think acoustic, I think kind of flowing, you know, gentle music with a great vocal, and then when, when they really needed to, to be more powerful, they were. But Uriah Heat, man, right off the bat, as you're going to hear in just a few minutes, Gypsy just, bam, here we are, we've arrived, and we're making a statement. And I love that. I love that they just went for it from the get-go. Um, but, but really, uh, the, the pioneering side of what they did musically was just amazing. And when you look at the elements of the people that were in the band, it's, it's no surprise that they were able to come up with something just absolutely stunning. Um, but I want to I wanna take a step back, actually, before we get any further into the podcast, because there's some people I want to thank and some things I want to say about the show. Uh, obviously, the, the first episode is going to be a little bit longer than, than most episodes will be. Probably the first uh, episode of each season, each season will be uh, a, an individual album. So I think that each of those will probably be a little bit longer because I'm going to be talking about the album itself on the whole a little bit and then get into the songs themselves. But, uh, but first, I want to say that um, this is a fan podcast that is endorsed by Uriah Heap. Uh, I'm very honored to have their support. Thank you again, Mick. You've been awesome to work with. 
Um, I want to thank also the band's manager, Ace, who has been uh, of great help. And he has a really cool podcast that you should also check out called Ace on Music. Uh, I listened to it on Stitcher, and I know it's also available on YouTube and probably some other outlets, but check it out. Give them ratings, give them feedback. Uh, it's a great show, very knowledgeable, all the people that are on it, and uh, just a lot of fun to listen to. So check that out. Um, I also want to thank my graphic artist, Scott Wazinski, who uh, did the logo for the show. And I, I, I absolutely love it. And um, he worked very hard. And he actually gave me several different samples to choose from. And it was really tough because they were all very good. But I landed on this one. And who knows, we may do an update on it or something down the road. I, I'm always open to change. But there, you know, you want there to be some familiarity when people are searching through. You want them to know, uh, you know, that that's the show that they've listened to. So I don't know. We'll see. Time, time will tell. This is only the first episode. I also want to thank my brothers in the Deep Dive Podcast Network. Uh, Nate and John, you guys are amazing over at the Deep Purple Podcast, which is obviously a podcast about the music of Deep Purple. Uh, also, the Skimple, Man, the Skimple Man, I could talk today, the Simple Man at Skinnerd Reconsidered Podcast, which is all about the music of Leonard Skinner in its first incarnation. Uh, T -Bone, uh, Terry T-Bone Mathley over at T-Bone's Prime Cuts. Rye at the Sabbath Bloody Podcast. Now, Sabbath Bloody Podcast has gone beyond all the music of Black Sabbath now and is into the Ozzy Osbourne uh, territories. Joe, Paul, and David over at Lap of the Pods, which is a wonderful podcast about the band Queen. And uh, also, you know, as a side note, check out uh, my friend Allegra, who runs GottaHearEmAll.com, and she digs into the uh, live performances of the bands Deep Purple and Emerson, Lake, and Palmer slash Emerson, Lake, and Powell. A lot of great information uh, over there, especially if you're just a, a fan of music history and some of these great concerts and, and festivals that these bands have played. Uh, seen them both uh, multiple times and, and um, just wonderful music all around. Uh, and also my friends over at Audionamics, as any of you who listen to my other show and know me know, I will not do a podcast without Instant Dialogue Cleaner made by Audionamics. And they're absolutely wonderful people to work with. So check them out if you are doing anything with vocals or broadcasting. Uh, they're the people to know. And they have uh, another really great product out called Extract Stems, which uh, if you're a musician, you might want to take a look at. Even if you're just learning or want to practice songs, you know, figure out a guitar solo. It's a great product. So that is all the disclaimer stuff. And now we're actually going to start talking about the song Gypsy. Now on the deluxe CD, there are two versions of the song. There is the standard studio release, and then there is an extended edition. Now the extended edition is pretty interesting because it takes out the, uh, the part where the music stops and there's just keyboard. It actually loops back in the main riff again and extends the song that way. And then everything after that is the same. So it, it is an extended version. But there's really no new material in it. Nothing. Uh, it's not an alternate version. So my guess is it was probably done for some kind of promo or something. Uh, you know, the record company is the one that typically makes the decisions on these kind of things. Most of the time, the band has no knowledge or say so of it. They find out after the fact. Uh, sometimes they don't even find out until the release has come out that something was done to their song. So it's, you know, even back then when it seemed like the bands had a lot more power, um, a lot of times they didn't, you know, the record companies inserted themselves, did what they were going to do. They were responsible for making the money. So they did what they felt they needed to do. But uh, a lot of times it was not a collaboration on the part of the band. It was very separate entities doing different things with, uh, with what they legally could do. So that being said, uh, before we get into the song, I think it would be a really good idea to find out what Mick Box thinks of this song. Well, Gypsy was written um, specifically for Uriah Heep, whereas a lot of the songs on their first album, Very Heavy, Very Humble, were actually a bleed over from the band Spice that became Uriah Heep. Um, so it's a special song. It's a really earthy riff that just resonates with everyone. But the little interesting um, information regarding the intro, which is quite unique, um, a lot of that was written by David. He, he, he was doing the chopsticks on the, um, the piano, just using the, um, the first finger of his left and right hand. And he, he, he played this pattern and then we, I kind of honed it down with him and we, um, we came up with that intro. Um, but it's a good, the good thing about the song is that, um, introduced, um, one of the highlights of your eye in terms of trademarks being the, the, the harmonies, because we use the harmonies, um, 
not just sweetly on a chorus or anything like that. We used them almost as another instrument with the big block harmony R's and um, that became a big trademark of ours and, and uh, many people went on to copy that and uh, take it even further, I believe. <laughs> but, um, yeah, um, Gypsy's a song. Um, uh, lyrically, um, David and I had a, a real fascination with the nomadic life of Gypsy's in England that travelled around in caravans and just parked up wherever they wanted and lived their life there and then moved on where they wanted to move on. And that lifestyle really, really appealed to us and um, kind of became true in the end because uh, we ended up living out of a suitcase anyway and uh, moving from city to city to play shows. So, um, yeah, it was just a fascination we had with Gypsies and uh, and that's how that lyric came about. So um, I hope you enjoyed me sharing this with you and uh, take care and keep on rocking. Well, there you have it. And it's certainly nice to know that I am not the only one that sat in front of a piano playing chopsticks for what seemed like an endless amount of time. Uh, We'd go over to my grandfather's house uh, where he had a piano and he taught me chopsticks at a very young age. And uh, I think I can still play it, but I'm not sure if I'm playing it right. (laughs) But it's interesting that that was part of where uh, the section of Gypsy came from. Interestingly, as a side note, I was also very fascinated by uh, the idea of the gypsy life and really got heavily into uh, what's called Roma music or Romanian music, which was written by uh, that uh, that group of people. And it's very, um, some of it is kind of sad, and, but a lot of it is just, you know, they're party songs, they're uh, introspective songs, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, violin or fiddle, I guess it would have been. But uh, definitely there's, there's some really good stuff out there. So uh, in your spare time, that may be something that you want to look into. Also, uh, you know, Mick talked about Spice, and I, I definitely see where he's coming from because I've always felt that this album was a little bit more eclectic than most of the other albums because you've got so many different styles of music on it, whereas the follow-up album Salisbury seems a little more cohesive to me. And, you know, I don't know, this is just my opinion. But uh, I, I've always felt that this album was a little bit unique and, and probably seeing it in this light a little more transitory. But he's right. They, they just came out of the gate. They defined their sound right off the bat. So if you hadn't heard of them and you were at a friend's house in 1970 and he's like, hey, I just got this album by Uriah Heep. Let's check it out. And you're like, who's Uriah Heep? I don't know. And you put the album on right off the bat. You know, you know who this band is. They define their sound with everything. They put their stamp on this song and said, this is who we are. And I think that's fantastic. And it's a great album opener, uh, as well as an introduction to the band. So we're going to talk about the intro of the song uh, a little bit later after we go through the song itself. So I'm not going to comment too much on that now. Uh, We'll get to that later and uh, actually going to analyze that a little bit because I think there's uh, an interesting thing about it that we've kind of lost over the years. And and hearing this again really kind of warms me up to the idea of how it was recorded. So we'll get to that later. But for now, I think we should just start listening to the song. And it features David Byron on lead vocals, Ken Hensley on keyboards, Mick Box on guitars, Paul Newton on bass, and Alex Napier on drums. And each one of them very much shows their skills and talents on this song, and uh, here it is. I'm just going to stop the song here for a second and point out something that's really cool. Now, thinking again in terms of the fact that this is the very first song on the very first album, I love how they introduced each band member in layers. I mean, we haven't heard the vocals yet, but every instrument you hear one and then you hear the next one added and then you hear the next one added. It's like when they show uh, a lot of times they'll show movies where they'll just kind of walk through the house and introduce everyone who's in the cast. That's a major player like uh, Poltergeist would be a good example. You know, you're following the dog through the house and the dog is walking you to each person, kind of introducing you to the fact that they're going to be a part of this project. And uh, and I really like that. It's a great build and it's a great way to um, kind of let everybody shine a little bit right off the bat. And also, you know, listening to the uh, the quality of the instruments, too, you've got great recordings already that you're hearing. Um, I love the level of distortion between the keyboard and the guitar just has a really great um you know, kind of an edge to it that lets you know that you're, you're, you better buckle up.
Now, let's just stop it here for a second because there's a couple things that uh, I should point out. One, the balance between all the instruments is absolutely perfect. The, the fact that you have a distorted guitar, a distorted keyboard, uh, and that is a, a B3 keyboard, not a C3 that uh, Ken is playing, but you, you really don't have either one of them drowning each other out. They're actually balanced quite well, playing so that you can hear what both of them are doing, but neither one is overshadowing the other one, which I really like. Uh, a lot of times if keyboards are a little too bright or too heavy, uh, they can overshadow the guitar, which the distortion tends to be uh, sometimes a little bit thinner of a sound for a guitar. But this actually is, is a great balance, great recording. And everything that's led up to this point, you've got a great build and then, you know, let's take a pause because we're getting ready for the next hill of this roller coaster. Really some great writing and performance here. I was only 17. I fell in love with a gypsy queen. She told me. Was the leading man said you're not welcome on our land and then as a foe he told me to go so there's some really interesting stuff going on here um the first thing that comes to mind is the uh, the kind of formula that uh, you would have in, say, Jimi Hendrix's Let, uh, Let Me Stand Next to Your Fire, which also inspired uh, Speaking by Deep Purple, because you've got that, uh, you know, here's a bunch of music, now we're going to put the vocal in, so we need the music to back off and give room to the vocal, and the music really subsides to let David Byron's voice shine through. And uh, that's pretty cool, because there's a lot of different tricks that you can use, but this band has so many things that they can do, so many tricks they can pull out of the bag, they don't drown all the things they can do at the same time so that you can't hear any of it. They really give space to each other to be able to shine in their parts. And I love that. Also, and I don't know that I ever noticed this before, but you hear a couple of stick clicks going out uh, in the middle of this as well. So uh, that's kind of interesting. That adds a little bit for me, uh, mainly because it's, it's a new thing that I haven't heard in, in, you know, through different headphones and speakers that I've listened to, but uh, kind of fascinating. Wow. Uh, just a, a very powerful solo. The band being very solid, backing up Ken, leaving him the space to do what he needs to do to move the song forward. 
And what a great solo. You know, it's not all over the place. It's not a bunch of different octaves. It's really kind of centered in two sections of the keyboard and just a very solid uh, performance. But what is also interesting is listening to what's going on in the back. Obviously, you've got some really nice accents uh, on the drums. I really love what Alex played on that. But also, you've got uh, a lot of uh, alternatives on the bass line. He's not just playing the same thing. And I, I said to Paul in the interview that that's one of the things I really liked about his playing was he didn't just play, here's what I'm supposed to play, repeat. He made the bass a very interesting instrument to listen to as well as everything else. And he could have just stayed on the root notes. He could have just been playing quarter notes. He could have done his part to keep the song uh, solidified in its foundation. But he did something that's a little more creative, makes the song a little bit more interesting. And again, just kind of has that that King Crimson feel to me where... Um, they, they, you know, every instrument was shining on its own, as well as being supportive to the instrument that was in the lead of everything. So very, very cool. And then here's where the song takes a little bit of a turn. Okay, so take this next part of my thoughts uh, just with a grain of salt. This is just kind of my take that I've always had on the song. This is the part to me where, you know, he feels defeated and the music just kind of dies down. And then you hear, you know, just the keyboard and that's him at first feeling defeated, but then starting to gather a little bit of strength and determination that he is going to fight for this. He knows he's outmatched at this point. So he's not just going to go in there guns blazing or swords blazing or whatever he's got. He's going to plan. He's going to, you know, strengthen his weaknesses and become something that cannot lose. And that's how he's going to fight and win this love of his. But it's it's almost like, you know, as the keyboards come in and then it pans from the left to where you could hear it in both ears. No, that's not your headphones. That's actually how the song was uh, released. But it's it's a matter of you feel that power growing in him. And by the time that he's really kind of making his determination, you've got some wonderful little notes from McBox. I almost feel like those are sort of a, a pep talk. Like, you know, when you see um, somebody getting ready to go into like a fight or a speech or something, and, you know, in the movies, you see like they're slapping themselves in the face or they're, you know, just like, yeah, you could do this. You got this. You got this. And I kind of feel like that's what that section is, or at least that's what it means to me. And as a musician, sometimes I write things with that intent, and sometimes it's just writing what feels good for the song on a musical level. So I don't know what was behind that, or if it was even, you know, a consideration the way I'm looking at it. But that's, again, just totally my uh, feeling that I've actually had from, from the first few times that I've heard this song. But I love it. I love the resolve in the character that we're about to hear. I love the determination, but I also love the intelligence of knowing when you're outmatched and knowing when not to strike, not letting emotion take control over your actions and really being smart so that in the end, you end up the victor. man that he'll understand 
I almost feel like those ahs are are kind of like battle cries. You know, you you imagine somebody, you know, slamming their fist against their own chest and just lashing out with all this energy and, you know, wanting to intimidate their opponent. Interestingly, from a lyrical standpoint, of course, he he knows that if he comes at this guy when he's more prepared, he's going to gain his respect. He's going to be like, I understand why you're coming at me. I get this. I understand you have to do it. I'm still going to give it everything I've got, but you have my respect as an opponent. Uh, I really like that idea because he wants to do things the right way. He wants to win, obviously. That's the, that's the end game, of course, but he wants to do it in a way that he knows is, is going to work. And I love this, this feel of this battle cry. But to go back to what Mick was saying, you certainly hear what you come to be known uh, as the stamp of Uriah Heep with that that vocal harmony that they're doing in here, because it's something that is uh, very much a staple of their sound. But now the song is going to take another turn and get a little crazy. What an ending to a fantastic song. So powerful. So just, it just kind of, if you're sitting down listening to it, it just makes you want to just jump up and tense all of your muscles and just go into battle. Uh, love it. Love the, uh, the free form there. I love the, uh, you, you know, the guitar being on the far left and the keyboard being on the far right. So you can hear, but you can still hear clearly what Paul Newton's doing on bass. You can hear what Alex is doing on drums. Everybody has a chance to shine at the same time which is great. It's, you don't hear that often in music. Um, even you know, when I've gone to, to some jazz improv here in Vegas, it's great because everybody respectfully backs each other up when it's time for that person to solo. They'll, they'll back off, they'll play, they'll keep the, the rhythm and melody going, but they'll really allow that person to shine, much like you hear in the rest of the song. But in this case, uh, at the end, it's like everybody's just like, I'm going for it, but you can hear everything that everyone's doing. It's got a great mix to it. And uh, really, really impressive. So that, uh, that's basically Gypsy right there, the, the introduction to Uriah Heep. So imagine again, imagine it's 1970, your buddy has you over, you're eating cheese and crackers, you know, you're watching the Olympics or whatever, and, and you're just like, this is going on. This is a new band. This is a band to watch. I cannot wait to hear what the rest of the album has to offer. How could you not? How could you not be pulled in after listening to this song? And obviously, it's it's one of their more famous songs now. Uh, but but you know, in that moment in time, that was the song. That was the introduction to the band. So I think it was a great start to the album. I think it was a great start to for the band to show who they are and define their sound uh, right from the get go. Now, one thing that I had uh, had mentioned in the beginning, and Mick had talked about the intro being interesting, uh, but. The way that this was recorded, now back then, there weren't click tracks. I mean, they had them, but they were very rarely used. And nowadays, everything is so, it has to be perfect to the click. If it's not to the click, the audio engineer will shift and move and bump everything so that it's, it's just perfect. But it's not as much human anymore. And if you listen to this song, you can tell that it's very human. It's very much a band playing live. Um, it seems to me that they were probably in the, in the room together and recording. Maybe they were in different booths or, or sectioned off, but they were certainly uh, in connection with each other because there was no click. So there wasn't really too much of, a, of another way to record it. They would do a count in, but there wouldn't be a click to stay on track through. So you would have to kind of depend on everybody with a part that opens the way this does to really just be in time or at least be together. It doesn't have to be exactly on the click if you're together. And this is a perfect example for me to demonstrate how that works. And uh, before I do that, though, we're going to hear from Russell Gilbrook. When I interviewed him last month, I asked him specifically uh, on the side of that interview about the song Gypsy and how, uh, how it was for him to take into this song when he joined the band, uh, since it was you know, not recorded right on the beat, as, as we'll hear in a minute. 
So I wanted to ask you about uh, your thoughts on the song Gypsy, because it has a really interesting uh, introduction. If I have it yeah. counted right, uh, the first section is in 10-4, and then the second section uh, goes back and forth between 7-8 and 5-8. But on the studio recording, it seems like it slips off of the click a little bit and actually uh, goes ahead of it. But when you guys play it now, I would imagine everything's kind of on the beat. Well, when it first, when the original, original, yeah, it's just played as they played it in the studio. There's no real time going on. Mm -hmm. So when we come, I, I was the one that actually suggested bringing it back because it was such a great intro. The guys never used to do it when I joined the band, see? Oh. And I said, no, we've got to bring the intro back because it's creating such a fantastic bit of tension before the riff kicks in. So when we started analysing, I said, look, we can't just, you know, blag it how the original recording's done. I, I don't really like that. I said, so I'm, I'm structuring it now. I said, and it's a bar of, um, uh, bar of, as you quite rightly said, bar seven and bar five. Um, and I told them that, and of course I had no, I, no real idea what I'm talking about. So I did have to teach them about it. And basically they do it on feel now. Like um, they just feel it, you know, but it is, it is, um, the bar seven and the bar five, yeah. You see, that's how I first learned it was I just memorized well, it's it. It's actually really. five and seven. Technically, it's five it's a bar five first, then a bar seven. Right. Yeah, you're right. I do have that backwards. Um, but when yeah. I first learned it, I pretty much learned everything back then because I didn't know how to count. So I mean I knew how to count, but I didn't know how to count music. So I uh I just learned it by memorization. But as I was breaking it down a couple of weeks ago, uh, I thought, boy, this is really interesting the way it was done. And then I realized, yeah, this is not on. I know that they didn't record to a click track, but it's not like solid on where the beat would be. And I found that kind of interesting. No. Uh, it has a good feel, but it does feel a little bit off. Yeah, it's just a bit, you know, back then, they, everyone played really loose. I mean, I like it. I would prefer to do it, but um, it just can't be done like that. You know, Yeah. unfortunately, the way in which... Um, music has moved forward and the way the bands move forward, it would just sound ridiculously messy to be that loose. So I just said, look, let's just tighten up, make it a bar five, bar seven. Um, we we'll speed it up a bit, give it a bit of energy, still create tension. I can do really fast. See, I've got all, I've got all those subdivisions in there on the snare drum and I've been the double bass drums in just to so it grows and grows and grows and grows. Mm -hmm. And then the release of the, um, the gypsy riff comes in, you see? So, um, yeah, and you're, you're you're right though. It's about five and about seven. Yeah. So is that where they would start the song previous to your changes? They would just start with the riff. Yeah, they come straight in. They've read the intro. Yeah, it seems kind of. It, it would seem a little weird to me to not have that build up. Yeah, I mean it's such a great intro. I, I like things like that on songs. You're, you're creating a little bit of tension before the actual groove of the song comes in, and it's so different to the groove of the song. It's a completely different um, time, um, and it just works great. So it got brought back in and it stays in now. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you for, for that contribution because I think it makes a big difference on the on the live set too. So uh, well done. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad it's a song that you enjoy. Oh, I love it. I love Gypsy as well. I love playing Gypsy. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you very much, Russell. I appreciate it. No problem, Scott. Thanks for asking me. So there you have it. That kind of goes back to that, uh, you know, we've lost the human touch in music because everything has to be so precise now. But, you know, it'd be nice to be able to do that live as well. But it, it does open up a lot of uh, dangerous territory for, for people kind of slipping off that scale uh, on their own, but in different directions. So uh, I could understand why you wouldn't do it live that way now. But just to give you a, a, a sort of a, a lesson or an idea of what we're talking about, if you're not familiar with it, then uh, here is Gypsy, but set to a click.
So even I'm trying to readjust to get, it, to get it to fit. But that gives you an idea. Everything is not exactly 100% on the beat. And I think that's great because it really is uh, human. You know, not everybody is going to play exactly the same at the same time. Somebody's going to be, you know, a slight bit ahead or a slight bit behind. So it, it really makes it a little more human. And, uh, and I really like that element of it. I think nowadays we're, we're losing that in the pursuit of everything being too perfect. But that's just my opinion. Um, you know, everybody's going to like what they like. A lot of people, especially now, expect everything to be perfect and, and precise. And they expect those kind of uh, differences to be maybe more in live versions. But depending on what kind of art that you're talking about with pop, yeah, I would expect pop to be exactly precise every time. Even live, a lot of it is uh, sampled and triggered. So you kind of expect that that perfection is going to be there. But with rock and roll, I've always felt that rock and roll is a live music. Even in the studio, even though it's being recorded, it's still very much alive and breathing and human. And this is a perfect testament to uh, how rock and roll was recorded back then. And what makes it uh, even a little more charming than just how great of the music, uh, it, the performances and the writing is. So a uh, really great example of, of uh, the differences between music then and now. But we're also talking 50 years. So we're talking a difference in technology. I mean, we're not very often uh, recording on reel to reel tape anymore, which obviously all of this was recorded back on reel to reel. And everything's just recorded in digital now. And a lot of the studios that are using, say, Pro Tools, for example, uh, they edit on the fly a lot of times. So by the time that the band's done recording, they've got their mix pretty much dialed in. They've got the effects put in. They may make some changes, but a lot of this is done now as the band is being recorded, as opposed to let's get a nice clean recording. And then the band goes away. The engineers do their thing. And uh, then the band finds out how, how it sounds when it comes out. So uh, some bands were more hands-on and some bands were, you know, they just left everything to the, to the recording studio. And, uh, but I have to say from a recording standpoint, I think the recording is done very well. The, the recording is very consistent through this album as we're going to hear as we get through each of these episodes. But yeah, a great song, a great recording and a great way to begin the album. So thank you guys so much for joining me for the first review episode of Uriah Heap the Magician's podcast. Thank you so much to Mick and to Russell for their input on the song. Very nice to hear uh, their, their thoughts and feelings on it, especially Russell, because he's coming to it with, uh, with the perspective of not having been there from, from the beginning and how the song has adapted in more recent years since he's joined the band. And uh, obviously, he's, he has a passion for the song just as much as everyone else does, which I, I absolutely love. Sometimes I feel like when people join bands that have an established history, especially bands that have hits, you kind of wonder if they're going to be like, oh, God, you know, I got to play this song every night. But, you know, I'll do it. Fine. I'll get through it. Or, wow, I get to play this song. And I love the wow, I get to play this song feel because, you know, that that's something that's certainly going to show in their performances. And the two times I've seen Heat play uh, when they've done this song, it's, it's certainly been with every bit as... Uh, excitement and energy as every other song that they performed on those nights. So uh, it may be 50 years old, but the passion is every bit as alive now as it was when it was written. So thank you guys. We'll uh, see you in the next episode when we talk about song number two on Very Evy, Very Humble. Cheers. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Uriah Heap, the Magician's Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, please consider going over to Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast outlet, leaving a rating or a review. Be sure to subscribe to make sure that you are notified when new episodes are available. Please be sure to share this podcast with your fellow Uriah Heap enthusiasts and anyone who you think would like Uriah Heap, which should be everyone. And if you are so inclined, please feel free to contribute to the Patreon account. And if you are not a Patreon subscriber, you can also pay through the PayPal link on the website listed in the show links below. I would also like to thank Uriah Heap for their very generous support of the show. And thank you guys for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Happy days.